Hey, good morning. My name is Troy. I'm one of the pastors here. And I am so glad you're here live and in person. Yes. <laughs> I know, man. That was uh, some kind of weird COVID break. And then I thought the ice was going to be like, oh, no, we're going to have to cancel. So uh, glad it worked out. Thank you for braving the ice. And especially those of you who came from Oak Island. And also want to welcome those watching online. So glad you could tune in as well. As we continue in our series called "Is Complicated," now <clears throat> sometimes, as you know, we're um, addressing the complicated matter of sex today. I actually, I told the band, I said, "Hey, can we?" Um, you know, they're always trying to make the music like thematic for the sermon. I'm like, "Can we do like sexual healing by Marvin Gaye? <laughs> kind of open up the sermon. That would be awesome." But they, oh, <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I used that joke last service, and so they queued up the music. I see how they are. They're, they're ahead of it. Um, so um, we are talking about sex today and how complicated it can be, but it doesn't have to be uh, if you follow God's plan. And, but sometimes when we address sexual sin, I say we, pastors, Bible teachers, you know, folks like that, when we address it, um, especially in the last... 10, 20 years, we have a tendency to tiptoe around it. Um, it can be a controversial topic, so we um, sometimes apologize almost for God's word. Well, I, I want to be straight with you today, uh, honest with you up front. I don't want to offend anybody with anything I say today. I mean, we're trying to grow Generations Church. I don't want to run people away from the church because they disagree with me and all that. But if I'm just being honest with you, I'm way more scared of God than I am of you. Um, and I, I'm serious. So, like, I'm, I'm not going to tiptoe around a very serious topic, a very, very important topic. I'm going to be as honest with you as I can about what God's Word says. Because you know what? I've struggled with sexual temptation, sexual sin, um, really hard in my teenage 20, you know, teenage years, 20s. And I've always appreciated it when someone was honest with me about God's word, honest with me about, and, and held me accountable when my life didn't meet up to the standards of God's word. I've always appreciated that. So I'm going to do that today. I'm going to talk to you like an adult. This is a very adult topic. And, and with that in mind, you probably saw the warnings out in the hallway, but I'll give you another one anyway. This is a PG-13 sermon. Um, which, which means, I mean, if you're middle school, high school, obviously it's fine, but you'll hear worse than this at school this week. But, but if you're treehouse, you have, you have treehouse or nest age kids in here today, um, unless you want to have the birds and bees talk this afternoon when you get home, uh, I would recommend slipping out and taking them to the nest or treehouse. Normally we close those environments 10 minutes after the service starts for security reasons, but today they're open right now. So if you want to slip out at some point and take your kids there, that, that would be great. Now, let me begin with this idea because this has been my prayer as I prepared this sermon. This is what's helped me to be sexually pure uh, through the years. As much as I may, I've been able to, I haven't been perfect, but as much as able, this, this idea has helped me through the years more than anything else. And so this is where really what I'm hoping I can relay to you today. And this is really a, a huge idea in the Bible. It's the fear of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 is one of those verses that mentions it. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Like if you want to be wise, <clears throat> here's where it starts. The beginning of wisdom, the foundation of wisdom is to fear God, respect God, love God, respect his commands. Don't blow him off when he, when he says something, but you know that God could punish sin. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. You want to make good decisions. Know God, fear his commands. If I could give you any gift today, and I pray this for my kids, I pray this for my family, I pray this for you, I would give you the gift of the fear of God. God will punish sexual impurity. God will not be mocked. If you choose to rebel 
against God in the area of sexuality, you will pay the price with pain in your body. Joshua Cattison sings this really catchy song um, that I think has an awesome line. Um, the song is named for the main character, this flaky chick named Jessie. And um, Jessie kind of comes in and out of the singer's life, and, and you can just tell she's just kind of like, you know, doesn't have it all together, but she's this sexual temptation for uh, Caddis, and I don't know if he wrote the song, but he sang it. It's a great song. From a phone booth in Vegas, Jessie calls at 5 a.m. to tell me how she's tired of all of them. She says, baby, I've been thinking about a trailer by the sea. Sorry, I can't sing. Um, we could go to Mexico, you, the cat, and me. We'll drink tequila and look for seashells. Now, doesn't that sound sweet? And so at this point in the song, it changes from the singer, you know, what Jesse's saying to him, and now he's talking to Jesse. Jesse, you always do this every time. I get back on my feet. Like I'm getting my life together and then you call and then it's just a mess again. And then the chorus, and this is my favorite part. <clears throat> Jesse, paint your pictures about how it's gonna be. By now, I should know better. Your dreams, they're not free. Jesse's so good at painting this picture of a sexual escapade by the sea. And in that way, she's a lot like Satan and his demons who paint this picture in our lives of you'll enjoy this sexual fantasy. There's no commitments like marriage. There's no rules like God's law. Just sand, a cat, tequila, <laughs> sex. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be so much fun. And yeah, it, it will be fun. But I love that the song the, that the songwriter and the singer honest enough to say, I've been down that road. I've been down that road with Jesse, and it's not free. There's some pain and there's some regret involved in that road. We're, we're in this series called It's Complicated. And we said in week two of the series, we said that clarity brings conviction, um, that the more we can be clear about God's commands, about God's law, the clearer it is, that the, not that it guarantees we'll be obedient to it, but it's, the easier it is to obey God when we clearly know his word. But here's what Satan does. Satan comes in and he says, did God really say that? <laughs> and if God really said that, is that what he meant? Is God trying to keep you from some kind of fun? And he makes the commands foggy. He makes them confusing. He makes them complicated. And, and there's no area where he does this more effectively than the area of sexuality. He loves to take the commands of God and twist them and make them complicated and make them confusing to us. And I'll, and I'll give you four areas that uh, maybe you've been confused in the past about pornography, um, you know, what pornography is, what Satan loves to do is come in and go, hey, it's not a sin to look at the human body. It's a natural thing to do. No one's getting hurt. No one's gonna find out. God knows you have needs and you've gotta meet those needs. Fornication is sleeping with someone you're not married to. And Satan loves to tell us it's not a sin if it's consensual between two adults, right? You, I mean, you love each other, you're probably going to get married anyway. I mean, go ahead and satisfy yourself now. Adultery is having sex with someone who's married, whether you're married or someone you're sleeping with is married. And, oh, boy, he loves to lie, with us, lie to us about this. Your spouse isn't meeting your sexual needs, and God wants you to be happy. I remember a, a guy sitting in my office who was contemplating leaving his wife he was having an affair. He was having adult, committing adultery. And he said, you know, Troy, a lot of Christian couples divorce. Huh? So that's your reason? A lot of Christian couples divorce, so I'm going to have an affair too. And then homosexuality. He's been lying a lot in the last few years about this one. It's not a sin as long as we pursue a monogamous relationship. 
God made you that way. And if God made you that way, then it's okay to fulfill yourself in that way. And we've all heard these lines. We've all, you know, in some cases, believe the lies that Satan has told us, the things that have made life so complicated. And, and let's be honest, when we follow those lies and we believe those, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make life less confusing. It makes it more confusing. It makes sex more confusing. It makes relationships more confusing. And it certainly doesn't make them better. God's way is the best way. And I speak from experience. And God's way is so simple. It's so uncomplicated. And again, in the long run, it's absolutely the the best way. Here's God's way. One man and one woman in a lifetime commitment of marriage. Well, Troy, what about same-sex attraction? What about when a man leaves a, a woman or a woman leaves a man? Just hold up. We'll talk about those in a second. Let's don't jump in. Let's just let God's plan soak in your minds for a second. Just stare at it, okay? This is God's best for us. This is God's plan. Jesus explained it in plain language in Mark chapter 10, verse six. But God made them male and female, not babies, right? Male and female, from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, come one flesh. The two are united into one. Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Isn't that simple? A man and woman in a lifetime commitment of marriage. Now, that's not the norm today. That's not even the norm that's being taught that is the proper thing to do. But could you imagine if this was the norm today? One man, one woman in a lifetime of marriage. How many problems could be solved in the world if this became the norm, if God's plan became our plan for our life? One of the things that I tell dating couples all the time, if I meet one and, (coughs) excuse me, they're dating or engaged or whatever, I tell them, look, if you want to simplify your relationship. Like you want to know, is this the person I'm supposed to be married to? And you want some real discernment? Is, am I supposed to spend the rest of my life with them? The single best thing you can do is don't get physical. Like if you get married, there'll be plenty of time after you get married to be physical and you'll be so glad you waited. But right now, just get to know each other as friends. Don't get physical because as soon as you start ripping your clothes off, as soon as you start sleeping together, all of a sudden it's gonna get emotional. And when it gets emotional, it gets really hard to discern truth and things you need to know about that person. You're not gonna know it because the physical blinds you. And I just see this all the time. Like matter of fact, if I see a couple and they're just breaking up, getting back together, breaking up, getting back, arguing all the time, I can almost guarantee you they're sleeping together. Almost guarantee you because they're they're unwilling, they've got problems in their relationship, but they're unwilling to face those problems because they keep masking it with emotionalism and physicalism. We can just solve our problems, let's sleep together, solve the problem, but it doesn't solve the problem. I mean, people will tell me, you know, I love him, but I'm just not sure I'm supposed to marry him. Well, let's, let's try this. Stop having sex for five minutes. Like become friends with them first, go into the relationship with your eyes wide open and your pants zipped up. And you might find that this is not the person I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with. Try that, try God's way. God's way, so simple and is always the best way. Same thing with homosexuality. One of the things that has become an obsession for Disney and Netflix and Google and liberal politicians the last couple of years is adding letters to the homosexual label, Um, you know, the LGBT. So declare, and then declaring someone who calls themselves one of those initials, one of those labels, a hero, and those who maybe disagree with it, well, you're a moron and a homophobe and you're a bigot and you're on the wrong side of history, right? 
So several years ago, it was the word gay, you know, which used to mean happy or whatever, you know, meant homosexual. And then it became LGBT, lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender. And I, I didn't know, I had to Google, you know, the latest one and maybe I was wrong, you know, and even what I found, but the latest one that I can find the right, correct, politically, politically correct label is LGBTQIA, meaning um, the Q is queer, intersexual, asexual, and a plus because there's probably another letter coming. And, <laughs> and listen, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not mocking that. I'm not. If you struggle with homosexuality, I, I know that's, that's a struggle. But the reason I point this out is because when we veer from God's way, it doesn't get simpler. It gets more complicated, right? God's plan is so simple, we veer from that, it, it just gets confusing. And for those of you who struggle with homosexuality, man, I know it, got, it has to be confusing because you're hearing one thing from a pastor like me who calls it a sin, and then you may go to another church and hear another pastor who says, you, you know, it should be celebrated. It's confusing. So if I could, I'd like to tell you a story from my life that maybe will be helpful for you. Maybe it won't, but maybe it will be. When I was a teenager, a friend of mine, I was in middle school, age fifth, sixth or seventh grade, a friend of mine whose dad was addicted to pornography, and this is before the internet, they had magazines, Playboys and Hustler and stuff like that. But his dad, you know, would, had these little magazine collection in his closet. And my buddy called me and said, hey, Troy, you got to come over, check this out, because I guess he had just discovered it. And so he showed me that magazine when I went over to his house. And it's the first time that I remember seeing a naked woman. And I mean, that's one of the wonders of the world. And I, I mean, my mouth dropped and there was a tingling inside and I was like, whoa, that's amazing. And so every other month or so, he'd call me when dad got a new magazine, you know, and I'd go over and, you know, check it out. And, and it was, you know, kind of... Um, all through my teenage years, college years, whatever, not a daily struggle, but there'd be a movie or there'd get the internet or the phone or whatever, and it'd be this struggle. And the reason, thank God, it wasn't a daily struggle, it was an occasional struggle, is because I was a follower of Jesus Christ at that point in my life. I had the Holy Spirit. And so I was convicted of sin whenever I would look at one of those images, right? Right? But it, was a, but it was an ongoing battle in my life. Now, at some point in my struggle, if someone, a pastor, a, te a Bible teacher, someone in my life that I respected would have pulled me aside and said, hey, Troy, um, I heard you struggled with, you know, looking at pornography. Stop struggling. God made you with a desire to look at naked women. It's not a sin. It's a natural part of who you are. Embrace it explore it. You're not a sinner for doing it. Matter of fact, you should be celebrated for it. Matter of fact, you're courageous to stare at naked women. Now, as ridiculous as that sounds, and it does sound ridiculous, that's exactly what we've done with homosexuality. Whole denominations are splitting over the issue of ordaining gay priests, of, uh, or, you know, um, officiating gay weddings in the church of, you know, people who are transgender, lesbian, gay, being a part of church leadership. Something, listen, something that is clearly a sin in the Bible. I mean, it's not even debatable. Not by anyone who takes the Bible seriously. Like, if you don't take the Bible seriously, okay, you, you know, anything goes. But if you're taking the Bible seriously... It's clearly a sin in the Bible. And I've listened to these YouTube debates where pastors on both sides of the, of, the, you know, of the issue will argue about it. And I just shake my head and I'm like, seriously? I mean, this is not even, I could give you a dozen passages in the Bible from God's word that clearly condemns homosexuality as a sin. Now listen, not more of a sin than pornography or adultery, or fornication, but a sin nonetheless. So, so I say all this to say this. If you're not willing to stare at this sin, homosexuality, for example, and call it a sin, 
or call adultery a sin because you're involved in an extramarital affair or call pornography a sin, whatever. Like, you are so welcome here at Generations Church. I'm glad you're here. I love that you're here, but there's not a lot I can do to help you. Like when, when we take God's word and we go, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna disagree with it because it doesn't match up with my lifestyle. As soon as we do that, we put ourselves on a path to incredible pain and suffering. When we rebel against God, it never goes well for us. So there's not a lot I can do to help you. I wanna help you. But if you would agree with me that homosexual, adultery, fornication, pornography, all these things are a sin against God, well, well, I can help you. And I wanna help you today. I'm not perfect. I've already told you that. We're not a perfect church, but we're a church that hates sin. And we're gonna preach against sin and we're gonna do our best to live against sin because our Father in heaven loved us first. And because he loved us, we wanna love him and please him in return. And so we come to God's word, not like it's a buffet. We don't pick and choose. We go, okay, God, what do you have for me? I'm gonna follow you and I'm gonna obey you. And so if that's you with the time we have left and you're serious about being pure sexually and fighting against sin, I wanna give you something that's gonna help you today. Some motivation to stay pure and be holy, okay? And again, I'm going to do it because I'm going to try to relay the fear of God to you. There's a passage in the Bible that I love that is a painful picture of the consequences of sexual sin. And I wish, oh, I wish I had like an hour just to break it down verse by verse. God has used this chapter in my life so many times through the years as I've struggled with, you know, compromising in my dating life, whatever, just keeping me on the right path. But it's Proverbs chapter seven, and I'm gonna read a part of it. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I hope you'll take time to read the whole chapter. It's so good. But it's Solomon who's looking out the window of his house, an autobiographical uh, chapter. And, and if anybody should write about sexual sin and messing up, it's Solomon because he made, believe me, he made a ton of mistakes. And so he's trying to help us learn from them. While I was at the window of my house looking through the curtain. I saw some naive young men, and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path by her house. So he's telling the story of something he saw out of his window, but, it, but it's a metaphor for sexual temptation because whether it's adultery, which this story deals with, or, or any other kind of sexual sin, you'll see the same elements exist in all sexual sin, all right? It was at twilight in the evening as deep darkness fell. Sin loves darkness. It loves the anonymity and the secrecy that darkness provides. Um, the woman approached him seductively dressed and sly of heart. So this woman, this adulteress comes up to him and she is cunning and so is sexual sin. It is sly, it is tricky, it is deceptive, it is alluring. And again, I'm not gonna read the next few verses to you, but what the woman does in the next few verses is she allures him to her bed. And what, he, and what she does is she uses all the senses and she describes how her bed looks, how it smells, the fun they're gonna have when they get there. And she is just so good. At, matter of fact, it reads like a trashy romance novel. If you're just looking, you know, to read Proverbs 7, it's, it's powerful. But, but you read it, and I want to skip down to verse 18, where she closes the deal. Verse 18, come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's enjoy each other's caresses. You know, let's, let's partake in it. For my husband is not at home. He's away on a long trip. He has taken a wallet full of money with him and won't return until later this month. Do you see what she just did? See what she did with her words? Um, basically, she's going, she does what Satan does to us every time we're tempted sexually. Come partake of the pleasures of sex without facing the consequences of sexual impurity. Come, my husband's gone on a long trip. He's got lots of money. He's not coming home. 
There's no accountability for what's, for what's about to happen. We won't get caught. No one will find out. We can enjoy ourselves with his sexual impurity all night and, and nobody will know except you and I. And he bought what she was selling. So she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. And before I go to verse 22, I, I want you to, I want to prepare you for it, okay? This is so, if you've been sleeping, wake back up, okay? I, these words I'm about to read, I want them to soak into your heart, your mind, and your soul because you're going to be tempted sexually at some point. Unless you've been castrated, I mean, you're going to be tempted sexually at some point. And what I'm about to read from God's Word, it, this is what makes God's Word so powerful and so different than anything else out there. Because we live in a world full of lies that tell us there are no consequences to your sexual impurity. And here's what God tells us. He, because He loves us, He tells us the truth. There's pain in that decision you're about to make. It's, there's regret. Don't go down that road. He followed her at once, like an ox going to the slaughter. You ever seen an ox or a cow go to the slaughter? You know, they're just following their master. They're going to somewhere where they're going to be cut up into pieces. He was like a stag, or a deer, it's like a buck, caught in a trap awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. I want you to picture this in your mind. There's a deer in the woods, and that deer's leg is caught in a trap. And do you hear the crunching of the leaves? He's coming, the one who set the trap. And he's got a bow and arrow in his hands. He's the hunter. And he's about to put that arrow through the heart of the deer. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost that bird his life. You know what all three of these animals have in common? They're all about to die a violent death, and they're too dumb to know it. They're too naive to see what's about to come their way. This young man has been so blinded by lust and the sexual fantasy that Satan painted for him through this woman that he's about to take steel from his life, and he doesn't even know it. And then God pleads with us through Solomon's words. He's pleading with us. Verse 24, so listen to me, my sons, and pay attention to my words. Wake up. Don't be like those animals. Don't let your heart stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path or his wayward path. You know, fill in the blank. For she has been the ruin of many. Many men have been her victims. Her house is a road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. Let those words sink in today. Matter of fact, would you mind saying the den of death? Would you mind just saying that with me? Den of death. What kind of picture is that? That's a dark one, isn't it? Do you know why sexual sin is a den of death? Because you will get caught. Um, it's the woman's lie. It's one of Satan's favorite lies. No one will find out about your porn addiction. No one will find out about your girlfriend on the side. Listen to me. Everyone will find out about it. Are you prepared for that? Everyone will find out about it. God will make sure they find out about it because you set yourself up against the Lord God Almighty. You will reap what you sow. God will not be mocked. Everyone will find out about it. God will make sure they do. And here's what I found. In most cases, I mean, almost every person I know who's been caught in an affair, pornography, homosexuality, whatever, it, 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 even, it wasn't even because they were, you know, caught as much as they revealed it themselves because the shame and the guilt of sexual sin, it can be overwhelming. 
And they just, you know, outed themselves. Uh, second thing, the den of death tells us is that when you get caught, it, it's going to be painful. You ready for pain? You know, part of what we're seeing in America right now is a culture addicted to sex. Having lost the fear of God, having lost the fear of God's word, we're going all in with a sexual revolution, aren't we? I mean, we thought the 60s and 70s was a sex revolution. Man, the last 10 years, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it's all in. And here's what we're seeing as a result of it. We're seeing sexually transmitted diseases, all-time high, herpes, AIDS, uh, abortions, depression. Oh, you think depression is not associated with your sexual rebe rebellion against God? Think again. Loneliness, mistrust, so many babies growing up in single-parent families, broken marriages, guilt, shame. We're reaping what we've sown. God's word specifically mentions two kinds of pain that come with sexual sin. Take a note, you can write these down. Pain against your own body. Um, I forgot to include it in the PowerPoint, but 1 Corinthians 6.18, you can read it when you get home. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as sexual sin does. It's a sin, the Bible tells us, against your own body. So like when you gossip about somebody, you're sinning against someone else, right? But when you sin sexually, you're shooting yourself. You're sinning against your own body. Now you may be, if you're committing adultery or something, you may be sinning against someone else, but for sure you're sinning against yourself. It's like sexual sin is different than all other sins. It brings a level of shame and guilt like no other, like you don't just get over it. You, you carry it with you, images and regrets. You carry them with you into a marriage. It doesn't mean God can't remove the shame and heal the scar. And he certainly has in many of our lives here. And some of you are in Celebrate Recovery and you're working through that right now. It's awesome to see God do that. But here, here's something better. Why go through it? When God's way is the best way, why go through that pain and that regret? And then the second thing is, is uh, the pain of deep regret. That's, that's part of the pain of sexual sin. Or to say it another way, the way Proverbs says it, sweetness that turns into bitterness. I mean, just bitter. The Bible freely admits that sin has pleasure for a season. It speaks of adultery in the book of Proverbs as stolen water that is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious right? It's honest about adultery and sexual sin. There is pleasure, but it gives us the full story. Proverbs chapter 5, for the lips of an immoral woman are as sweet as honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. You ever known somebody, a man or woman? Smooth, right? But in the end, it turns into bitterness in your mouth. It's as bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. The country song was right. The pleasure ain't worth the pain. The orange ain't worth the squeeze. In the end, that sweetness turns into bitterness and regret and pain. Oh, man. So what does obedience to God look like? How do we stay sexually pure in this depraved culture that we live in? Well, the first thing is the most important. We live life in the Spirit. This is something we talk about here almost every single week. We repent of our sin. We call sin what God calls it. We, 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 we agree with God about sin, and we repent of that sin, and we place the full weight of our faith in Jesus Christ because we believe that he died on the cross for our sin. And then watch this. The moment we trust Jesus, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit of God fills us up. We become filled with the Spirit. And it's, and it's life in the Spirit that gives us the power to overcome sexual temptation because the Spirit convicts us when we, when we get it wrong because we're not going to be perfect. I mean, I look back at, at all my years of dating and struggling with pornography and all. It was the Holy Spirit that told me, 
break up with that person. Holy Spirit who led me and guided me and preserved me for, so that when I met my wife, Tabitha, I was ready for that. And we've been married for 25 years, not because I'm a great person, but because I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. And Tabitha has the Holy Spirit inside of her and, and he's guiding us and protecting us. The Spirit of God will convict you when you need to be convicted and he'll guide you. Number two, singleness or transformation. This point is primarily to those who struggle with same-sex attraction. Um, clearly, I've tried to explain today, it's a sin against God. It's unnatural as the Bible calls it. Um, but you may decide, you know what, Troy? I wanna obey the Lord, but I don't have an opposite sex attraction. Well, for many people who, are, who struggle with homosexuality, they've made a decision to be single. Until God changes something inside of them, they're going to be a, a single person. You know what? Paul and Jesus were single. You could do worse, right? Um, but for many people, God will transform your desires. One of my best friends in the world was a guy who struggled with homosexuality all his years as a, in his 20s, and God transformed his heart. Today he's married and has three kids and loves his wife. But, but, but God transformed him. And that's something that God can do in your heart. As you yield yourself to Jesus Christ, he trans, transforms us from the inside out. Now, by the way, uh, last month in Canada, the Canadian parliament just outlawed what I just said. Um, they outlawed something called conversion therapy. That if somebody homosexual goes to a pastor or you know, a pastor says it in a sermon or whatever and recommends that you can be converted by the power of God, you can be imprisoned in Canada now for up to five years. That's, that's where we are. And you know, maybe that's coming to America. I don't know. If it comes to America, guess what? Um, we're still gonna preach and teach God's word, prison or not, okay? No, number three. Um, number three, heed the warning and end it now. This is, point is primarily those who are involved in premarital sex or extramarital um, affair, you're playing with fire. And, and, and maybe you've been flirting, maybe you've been you know, walking by our desk 10 times a day, uh, or maybe you've, it's already turned into something physical. I'm telling you, you're in for a world of pain. You'll, you'll experience pain like nothing you ever have before. It is, you play with fire, you're gonna get burnt. Stop rationalizing. Stop lying to yourself and to other people and cut it off. End it now. Obedience leads to blessing. Disobedience leads to consequences and leads to pain. I want to end um, today with a song I started with, Jesse. <laughs> so if you listen to the song, at some point, I think the songwriter um, succumb to the temptation of Jesse. We're going to try it again. Going to get a trailer by the sea, go to Mexico with a cat, whatever. And there's a bridge toward the end of the song that I want to read to you because I think it's just, well, here it is. I love you in the sunshine. Lay you down in the warm white sand. And who knows? Maybe this time, things will turn out just the way I'm here to tell you today, no, they won't. They won't turn out the way you plan. Don't believe the lie that Jesse's telling you. God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. Whatever we sow, that will we reap. Sexual rebellion against God will leave. It's not some sweet sexual escapade. It is a life of pain and regret, wishing, all oh, wishing that I would have obeyed the Lord and what he told me to do. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? I mentioned something earlier. I mentioned that confession is simply agreeing with God about what God said. And maybe today that's exactly what you need to do. I love that our Father loves us so much that he tells us truth when everybody else is lying. And so acknowledge that truth today. Repent of that sin. Call it what it is. 
and ask God to fill you up by his Holy Spirit as you trust in Christ, to give you the strength to change your desires. God can do miracles in this area. If you will submit your life to him, you're gonna see God transform you from the inside out. And look, it doesn't matter how far you've gone. God can redeem you starting right now, starting today. As I pray, would you pray your own prayer of faith? Just be honest with the Lord right now. Just agree with him. Father, I thank you that you tell us truth, that you love us so much, that you want a relationship with us, that you just speak to us um, in a way that we need it. And so, God, I pray that for those watching online, for those here seated in front of me, God, that you'd move by your Holy Spirit. We submit ourselves to you. Uh, we agree with you, God, about what you've said. God, many of us have lived it. We just know your way is the best way. So God, I pray that you'd open eyes today, that we could see that we would change, you change desires so that um, my friends here today would follow you with their whole heart. God, I pray for your healing. I pray for your uh, completeness. I pray for your salvation to fall down today upon us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now